Hello everybody, welcome back to Comedian MTG. My name is Ian. Today we're doing something a little bit different than usual. What are we doing here today? We are talking about the CEDH meta itself. What are we gonna be focusing on? We're gonna be focusing on the tournaments coming up. So right now, for those who do not know, in the next about month and a half, we have three separate high scale tournaments happening and you know, progressively more and more in scale as, as things are going on. So let's talk about the CEDH meta. Let's talk about what's good right now. I'm gonna give a little context Text on what tournaments I'm talking about, and then I'm gonna jump right in and talk about where I think the meta is at right now, what decks and archetypes to be playing in the meta right now, what the meta game of each individual tournament is most likely to look like, given a little bit of context, and then talking about only like meta busters, but just like the generic what should I be playing and if I want to play a good stuff shell, right? So let's talk about that and uh, you know break it all down. So first thing we're gonna do to provide a little context is talk about the different tournaments that are happening. First one is Chaos Tournament Three. So Chaos tournaments are something that spawned out of the CEDH Nexus, Chaos, who is an individual um, who I believe was a moderator at one time. I know was a moderator at one time because he was a moderator with me. Very awesome individual. I've actually covered either the second or first one of these tournaments on my top four breakdowns, so you can go find that right somewhere. I'll probably leave the link down below. But it's important to note these tournaments are spawned out of the CEDH Nexus. They tend to be a little... I mean, they, the scale of them is a normal tournament tournament size, right? We get 100 plus people at these things, so they're pretty pretty solid in scale. So the meta there tends to be more of your classic uh, meta that you would see at an event like Marquesa, something like that, where it's this amalgamation of people coming to compete, but people also bringing their pet decks, and I have a solid feeling that the meta in that tournament is going to be one that favors mid-range decks, so I would personally play something like a Dawn Wake or Thrasios into that meta. Um, obviously because it's uh, one of the best position decks in the format right now it's like keeps putting up results but also just because of the fact that I think mid-range decks are going to be favored when you have these sort of amalgamation metas when you have like a little bit of this a little bit of that and there's no dominant archetype mid-range decks tend to do very well because their inherent card quality allows them to kind of power through the diversity of matchups that you find and you're not suffering to one terrible matchup over and over again right like in a triple turbo meta mid-range deck is going to suffer a lot more right but but mid-range deck in a meta that has you know one turbo deck but also maybe a stacks deck or also two other mid-range decks or two commander centric combo decks right in those metas the mid-range decks tend to thrive so that's sort of the inclination that i have heading into a tournament like chaos the next two tournaments are going to be a little more specific now this would be my general inclination going into a general tournament right to aim for those mid-range decks decks that have been performing pretty decently in the tournament in the tournament scene overall these next two tournaments i think are going to have have a more specific variation of the meta right now and that's kind of one of the main reasons I wanted to talk about them today. So the tournament that will be following the Chaos Tournament most recently after that is Tier 1 Con. So this is Tier 1 Con Copenhagen. It's going to be featured heavily in the Danish meta. Now there are going to be people traveling from all over the world to head over to Tier 1 Con but obviously the European meta will be showing up in greater numbers because it's much easier for a European person to travel in Europe than it is for or someone from the United States to head on over. There's going to be a good amount of people there who are creators, things like that. But in general, we're going to see a large influence of the Danish meta. So let's talk about what that meta looks like. Well, if we think all the way back to last year's Tier 1 Con, the deck that won the whole thing was Cody, right? Cody came in, it was the fastest turbo deck in the format, and it took down the entire tournament. There was another Cody in the top 16, some other top 16 and top 4 decks we're talking about, Kark Sakshima, there was Inala, there was a second Cody deck, one copy of Winota, one copy of Kinnon, but... If you're noticing, the majority of the decks, I'm oh, and also Blue Farm, which was featured very heavily in that meta. So if you notice, a lot of the decks I'm talking about are leaning towards the more proactive side of the meta, right? The Tier 1 meta, I've noticed, is extremely heavy into things like Ad Nauseam, the Turbo Strategies, things like that. So what do you want to be thinking about when you're going into a meta like that? Well, the things I'd be thinking about are things that counter the Turbo Ad Nauseam strategy or things that have a stronger advantage in that area, right? So my general inclination would be to play something I'm comfortable with that counters that strategy very well, which would be something like Winota, right? You land one Deafening Silence and then suddenly all of these decks are kind of scrambling to figure out something to do. I know Mr. Bruce made a really deep run last year and lost to Breakers, not being able to make top 16 of that tournament, and Mar 
Bharatiam, who is one of the other Winota Primer authors, got top 16 in that tournament with Winota. So if I was playing Winota, I would be very comfortable in that meta if it still reflects what was happening last year. Now, obviously there have been developments in the meta. They also just had another tournament recently, which was three one-day tournaments that were qualifiers for this event. So if you really want to dive deep into those results, that's something interesting to check out. But Blue Farm did very well in those. A lot of the Turbo Ad Nauseam strategies did really well in those. It was a very proactive meta, much like it was indicated it, that happened last year. So these are all leading me to believe that there's not going to be a major shift in that meta, especially given the fact that, you know, a lot of people, if they like playing a certain type of way and they like playing a certain type of strategy, they're going to continue to play that way, right? Also, when it comes to Turbo Ad Nauseam, there is a big feedback loop there, right? The more Turbo decks are in a meta, the more you're going to consistently see Turbo decks performing well, right? And then when people try other things, they're getting punished because they're in a meta that has this sort of punishing effect. Turbo Nauseam is one of those strategies that the more there are in the pod, the harder they are to stop, right? So it, it does create this sort of positive feedback loop where you're like, well, the Turbo decks keep winning. It's like, yes, but you keep adding more Turbo decks to the pod, so they're going to continue to keep winning because, one, there's actually just physically more present, but two, it's harder to stop them if they're all just trying to do the same thing. If no one's interacting and everyone's just trying to go burr and keep their heads down, it's not going to, you know, lead to positive results for the other archetypes trying to, 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 to make a name for themselves in this format, right? So that's, that's my musings on what the Tier 1 meta is going to look like. So once again, things that we're talking about that would be good into that meta. Obviously, Blue Farm looks really good into that meta. The problem is you're going into that meta and you're going to be playing a lot of people who are going to be on that strategy. You have to be doing something that makes your run with this a little bit better. This isn't, once again, my opinion. There are other people who would just say, just play the best deck, do whatever. But if you're going to show up with Blue Farm to the Tier 1 meta, don't be unprepared playing Blue Farm, right? Play games with this deck, right? Play, get your reps in, stuff like that. If I was going to be playing a more turbo archetype, I would be more inclined to play Rog Silas. So let's let's take a look at just like the database right now. We've talked about Dawn Waker, right? For those who haven't heard of it in this channel, uh, I have an entire deck tech that I can link. This is what I was talking about for fighting the mid-range matchup, right? But let's talk about Blue Farm, right? So Blue Farm is considered by many to be one of, if not the best deck in the format. I think it is obviously a very uh, strong strategy. It's a very strong strategy, right? Like it is, it is extremely hard to deny that this is a very strong thing to be doing right now. And there's many people who think this is the best deck in the format. I don't know that I agree with that, but I do agree that it is sort of just playing easy mode in a good way, right? Like it is, it is going to be able to put up consistent results because you're playing some of the best cards in the format. You're, you're being proactive, right? You're going to punish opponents who are trying to sit on their back foot, right? And now with the primer list right now, there are definitely some choices I don't agree with that I like to point out here. Just in general, uh, for people like prepping for this tournament, I think the, the primer list that's on the database is kind of in this weird, contradictive state. And I know I've heard uh, Drake from the miscast also sort of reflect this iteration where it's kind of trying to play more creatures to lean into having Timna in the command zone, but... I think that is more of a reaction of in a very insular meta, you want your turbo deck to be able to grind more because that's kind of what Blue Farm is to the turbo strategies. It is it is the grindier, more card quality heavy version of what everyone else is doing, right? So I think the primer right now has options because of that. However, when you put it up against other decks like mid-range decks or stacks decks, these choices just start to seem very strange. So Grim Hireling is one of those choices. I think it's just taking four off your knob to get this card when you're really still only playing 11 creatures and you have Timnacrom in the command zone. I think the card's a little bit win more. That's just, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about. But apart from that, like, it's not... There aren't, like, crazy things that stick out. I know a lot of people are actually lower on the intuition package in this deck specifically. I still think, obviously, having a one-card win condition is pretty solid, but, you know, there are several in this deck. So that's, that's kind of one of them that you kind of have to parse through yourself. But, you know, you're playing some of the best win cons in the format. You're playing a lot of just powerful pieces, right? So just thinking about what your specific version of this deck looks like is kind of important going into a meta like that, right? I don't think a card like Grim Hireling gets paid off very highly into a, a turbo meta. But there are other cards that probably will, like... You know, things like Mnemonic Betrayal. So I've talked to a lot of people who play in a meta that I, I am sort of... I've, there's a Discord meta I spend a lot of time in, and a card like Mnemonic Betrayal is super powerful into that meta because everyone's just trying to go fast in that meta. 
in a place like Tier 1 Con, I think you definitely play a card like Mnemonic Betrayal, right? That is a card that is going to get paid off because people are wheeling, people are trying to jam turbo stuff. Cards like Compost, another good card in a meta like this, right? Because it's just going to, you're going to get paid off because your opponents are playing black spells, right? They're playing their rituals, they're playing their ad nauseums, they're playing all these things. You're going to be drawing cards off of Compost, or they're going to have stocked yards for your Mnemonic Betrayal. So just general things to think about. So that's Blue Farm, at least like the, the take on it for where it stands in the meta. I think it's still a very solid deck. I'm not trying to call it not one of the best decks in the format. I don't know that it's the best deck in the format that people so vehemently will say it is. Um, and I think it's it is, but it's a solid option. And if you're going into a meta like this, you can't really go wrong playing a deck like this. Let's talk about what I would play in that meta, which is... So this specific version on the database is not the way I would build it per se, but that's more nitpicky than anything else. But Rog Silas is definitely just so powerful into that meta. I have my version that I'm playing during the MLC. I don't think that would be perfect for a meta like this, but thought I should mention it here. But let's talk about what Rograk does. It does the turbo thing faster than everybody else, right? And that is a thing where you're just going to steal wins from people. Now, there has been sort of a weird controversy lately with, like, legacy players coming into the format and stuff like that, but Bryant Cook of the Epic Storm has sort of come in and sort of shaken up the format with uh, his version of his Rog Silas list, and it's the server in particular I was talking about has kind of gotten swept up by this version of the deck, and I think it's, it's very solid, right? It is just trying to do the thing as fast as possible, right? And that's kind of where you get these free wins. It's just, like, doing the turbo thing faster than the other people who are trying to do it in the pod. Now this version in particular is gonna get you a lot of free wins. You're playing some wild stuff like there's Doomsday in the 99, which is this whole musings about why that's totally fine being able to play it like that. But I, I just think Rog Silas is so well positioned to just steal free wins by doing the thing that you're trying to do as clean and as fast as possible, right? Rog Silas is gonna get you there that half turn sooner as, as people would like equate it to. So I think just doing that into a meta like the tier one meta is going to be solid. This is also a reason why you saw people doing the Cody thing last year, right? It is just one of the fastest ways to do the thing and one of the most consistent ways to do the thing. Now, I think last year there were a bit of free points earned by people not really understanding how powerful Cody was at the time, whereas, you know, as you saw with like Spleen Faces matchup in the Toxic scene, when people got what was happening, they actually played around it very, very well and were able to stop him. I will always prefer Rog Silas to Cody just as a player. I think you lose any sort of ambiguity on your game plan when you switch over to a deck like Cody. So whereas a deck like Cody can be teched against very well going into this meta and can be played around very well, given the fact that everyone's aware of what you're doing now, and it's not as much of a surprise factor as it was last year, I would much rather be playing a deck like Rockstar, where people know what you're doing, but you're just doing it fast. And you don't have to, if you're having a hand that's a little slower and you're going to pivot to a Thassa's Oracle Tana Pack plan, like that's not obvious. Whereas with Cody, like whatever it does is is very straightforward and very telegraphed. So that's my sort of musings for that. Definitely check out Bryant and his version of this deck. It's been doing very well lately. And he and Drake Sasser of the Miscast, both legacy players, both been performing in not just a CEDH sense. Um, they both sort of have musings on these thoughts and uh, definitely some people to listen to. I will say while I am, uh, you know, saying a lot of great things about these players, I also think, you know, they are just more voices to listen to, right? I'm not saying go listen to them. They have the entire format figured out because they don't, <laughs> but neither do I. But, you know, they have a lot of interesting thoughts about what's happening in the format right now, and uh, I believe there was an episode of The Miscast with all three of them, which is a really solid listen. I can link that in the description down below, too. And all three being Drake, Bryant, and Mikey, the other co-host of The Miscast. It's a very interesting listen. They have many things that I do not agree with about the format. There are perspectives on there that I vehemently disagree with, but I think they're very intelligent players. They're doing several things very right, and I think, you know, when you are trying to gain perspective on the entirety of CEDH, being able to listen to a number of different voices is extremely important. So definitely go check that out. And last event we're going to talk about here is Punt City. So Punt City, even more so everything I just talked about with Tier 1 Con, focus on that for Punt City because Punt City is being run by... Mikey of the Miscast. So I, I have a feeling a significant amount of traction is going to be people who play in the metas that you hear Drake and Mikey and Brian talking about in that episode of their podcast. This will be another quick meta. I play in a Discord server with a lot of the people who run Punt City in general. Um, so if you saw my episode promoting their their uh, tournament, that's the reason I like know most of them is we all play together a lot. <laughs> and so knowing a lot of the people who are running this tournament, I expect the meta to be very Grixis heavy. I expect the meta to be very ad nauseum heavy, a lot like tier one. This is kind of the 
there we have a lot of talk of like the Danish meta or the Finnish meta sort of historically referring to these like very ad nauseum heavy metas. Punt City will be that meta. <laughs> Whatever that meta is transferred to American players. It's just this very ad nauseum heavy format. There's a lot of people in there who are just trying to do the thing and doing it very, very quickly. It is the place where Mnemonic Betrayal will be good. It is the place where playing fast decks will be good. So you want that extra perspective of, I gotta either be faster than what they're doing or I have to be playing something that is going to be subversive to what they're doing. So like, for example, back to Dawn Waker, most CEDH metas, I take Dawn Waker and I perform very, very well with it. I would not expect to perform very well with it at Punt City or Tier 1 Con, right? Because it is a mid-range deck focused around having a few turns. But if you don't have those few turns to set up, you, you're kind of done, right? So the Punt City Tier 1 expectation is that that's not going to be a luxury we have. So playing something like Winota, where you can get your stacks pieces down very, very early, that would be something I would expect to give me a leg up. There are other archetypes I'd be looking into as well with these types of metas. If you remember me talking about my Malcolm Vile Smasher deck. So this deck, I, I would also be comfortable playing into that meta because it has one card win conditions. It has the ability to do the Grixis thing and go fast, but it has game into the later games with cards like Narset and Notion Thief being able to take advantage of things that people are doing in that Grixis space, right? I'm also on Mnemonic Betrayal on this list to be able to take advantage of playing against decks like that. Obviously, this is a Grixis deck, but it's definitely not the same type of Grixis that I'm talking about for these metas, right? We're talking about Turbo Ad Nauseum decks, trying, decks trying to sacrifice all their card quality to go as fast as possible or to be as explosive as possible. And what I'm saying here is more of a mid-range deck that happens to be in those colors as well. You know, still providing you the ability to go very, very fast if, if it arises, but also not just lose to a card quality game to something like a blue farm with a Grim Hireling, right? This deck can do more than just lose to a Grim Hireling. So what else do you expect to see here? I'm back over here at the database things in general that I like into these pods, right? So let's look at uh, the Timna Kodama list, Hulk of the East Weavers, which I have talked about beforehand. Legit Vocals performed very well at the most recent Chaos Tournament and at the previous Tier 1 Con tournaments with this deck. And the reason I like this deck a lot is, one, the explosivity of it, right? So you can get out an early Kodama and then sort of just cheat your way into a victory with a Rector line, things like that. It's not a dedicated stacks deck, right? It has stacks pieces like Collector Oof, Trandith Magistrate, Douthy Voidwalker, right? It has these pieces that are going to slow down your opponents. It also has things like Deafening Silence, which are very, very good into the meta we were just talking about, Blind Obedience as well, right? Null Rod. All of those things are very solid against Turbo decks, but this deck is still still proactive in trying to execute its own strategy, which is to get a Protean Hulk onto the battlefield and sacrifice it and kill your opponents. So that is the the thing you're expecting to do is you're expecting to do your Turbo Hulk thing, but you have several selective pieces that you know are going to be efficient against Turbo decks laid out throughout this list. So this is a list I actually expect to, if Legit Vocals was to be going to Tier 1 Con, I would expect a performance very well done by this deck, right? This is a deck that's just trying to do its thing and do it as fast as possible. This is a deck I would feel very comfortable playing into a Tier 1 or Punt City meta because of that reason, having selective pieces that are very potent in the meta without being a full commit to a stacks deck. I actually just listened to a Mind Sculptors episode where you hear Charles, the mono white guy, talk about how he would not feel comfortable piloting his top four Heliod deck into the Punt City meta because of the reasons that we talked about where the Heliod deck is meant to attack sort of a wide range of archetypes. Something like Dawn Waker has the ability to fight a larger range of archetypes. But his Heliod deck sacrifices that turn one so that you have these more potent threats as the game goes on and you win the late game. Same thing with Dawnmaker we were talking about, you need the setup, right? So because of that, not a deck you want to play in Punt City, right? You hear Charles, who is this dedicated mono white player, saying, I would not want to play my de facto mono white deck in this tournament. However, when it comes to other archetypes like that, where it has a little bit more of an edge to push forward, that's something he wants to talk about, right? So just more musings on what you can be doing in this format. Here's the thing. In a turbo heavy meta, there are several things you can do. You can either A, try and play 
completely around what the rest of the format's doing. So pieces that lock it down, like Deafening Silence, like Null Rod, stuff like that, and play a deck like, you know, Mons did very well with Five Color Sisse last year that was just a stack Sisse, so an archetype that's doing creature combos and completely avoiding the the parasitic nature of what's happening there, right? And the the sort of parasitic ad nauseum format, right? There was a version of Dawn Waker I used to play a really long time ago that was a Turbo Dockside variant, and that was something that I would play into this meta because it was just very explosive. And no, I don't have the list right now, unfortunately. It was just one of the oldest versions of Dawn Waker, and it's changed so much since that point. But basically, the idea would be like just play your Dockside as soon as possible. You will always win with a meal was kind of the idea with it because at the time people were just so obsessed with turbo and nauseum strategies that that's what they would do think about things that would be good into the turbo meta right if you're playing a turbo meta your interaction doesn't focus on creatures so think about maybe are there creature strategies that can avoid the hate pieces of something like an ad nauseum deck that can go fast hence my mentioning of malcolm i would also happen to think that teamer malcolm probably can keep up in that meta it might be a bit slow depending on the matchup. But the scenarios in which I think Malcolm Tano would be very, very good are scenarios in which you have something like your opponents, one of them tries to go off turn one, and then you're the second deck to try and go off with your glint horn, and because it's a creature combo and they already used up their interaction, they're done for. That's something that I can see this deck being very, very solid into. So so the Malcolm strategies, the early potential high explosivity combos, things like these that use creatures are gonna be solid. You just have to be around it. So I really like, yeah, so things like Minsk, like these, this legit vocals list that can use creatures as the win con, things that the counter suite isn't ready for, but also can execute their, their plan in a way that isn't going to drag the game out longer to give the turbo decks a chance to squeeze out from underneath you. I would not feel comfortable trying to drag the game out in this meta, because what usually happens is one player dies and then another turbo player takes advantage of the tempo swing the other way and then pops off. So mid-range decks I would avoid for these tournaments. Things I would look at are things like these decks that I've been talking about, things that can go fast but also have a bit of card quality so they don't just die to any sort of grind engine, right? And that's that's what I generally look at for these metas. That was a lot. <laughs> so it's a lot of thoughts on what the meta could look like moving into these tournaments, but I hope you all found this helpful. I've just wanted to do a video like this for a really long time because as much as I love just showing you all the flashy things you can be doing in the format or talking about a deck that's just very strong right now, I like just being able to just tell you what's up, <laughs> to being able to talk about what's good in the format and if y'all want, I can keep doing videos like this because I think they're actually, if I was prepping for a tournament, this is exactly the type of video I would want someone to provide for me. So please, please, please leave comments down below if this is something that you like. Please hit that like button, hit the subscribe button. It helps me out so much. If you want to keep seeing content like this, there are so many ways that you can help the channel out. One of which, in the most generous way, is obviously going over to patreon.com slash comedianmtg. You can get awesome perks like having your decks featured on the channel. Uh, you know, there are also private things anytime I'm talking about, you know, what I'm going to do next for the channel, things like that. I always put it to my patrons first. Anytime people want to catch games, I'm always talking to my patrons. I have several patrons now that just shoot me a bunch of questions. And as soon as I get time, they're, they're the people I answer all their questions for. So if you're really trying to, you know, grind out some serious CEDH games, if you're curious about your archetypes and decks you enjoy, trying to make them as competitive as possible, patrons are usually a first shot <laughs> at uh, getting my ear. So if you're feeling super generous, check out the Patreon at patreon.com slash comedian MTG. Please leave down in the comments what you thought about this video. I'm actually really excited to be providing content like this because I feel like if people are really serious about trying to grind the tournament scene for CEDH, this is how you do it. It's stuff like this. So please hit that like button. Leave a comment down below if you enjoyed this. Thank you all so much. Everyone who supports this channel is so greatly appreciated and I'm so grateful for all the support. So thank you so much. Have an amazing week. I'll see you next time. I, I, I can feel the blood creeping up from the heathens Got will, got fight, got pride, got reason If they wanna go eat, then you know I'm gon' feed them If you're coming for me, hope you're ready for a demon I got eyes in the back of my head, I'm seeing